the reading of God's word. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as the one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. I think that in the view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I will spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. As though, and those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the, with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraints upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Yes, this is a so far in, this, in the study of this chapter, chapter 7, I already pointed out two things about singleness. As you can see from the topic, I'm talking about singleness today because that's what this text is about. But I already said two things about singleness. One is that singleness is a calling that I shared that from the previous text. That it is, what do you mean? It is a condition of life assigned to you by the Lord. The Lord assigned to you. Either for a temporal period of life, temporal season of life, or a lifetime, it is a calling. Two, the other one is that singleness is a gift. Singleness is a gift. Remember? Let me turn your attention. This chapter, go to all the way to verse 7 and 8. This chapter, go up to the verse 7 and 8. Paul says, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of, other, one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good. For them to remain singles as I am. I, I don't know if you notice it or not. We see the expression remaining a lot in this chapter. Remaining, circumcision, uncircumcision, remaining, remain where you are, remain. Remaining as a single is good. Each have a different gift. Marriage is a calling and a gift. And the, so the singleness too is a calling and a gift from the Lord. Am I clear? Now, based on that, I can draw two things. If singleness is a calling, then it has a purpose. If a singleness is a gift, then it is good for you. In other words, it is beneficial to you, for those of you who are single. So, I'll say this. It is beneficial and purposeful. Singleness is for Christian, is for beneficial and purposeful. And this is not just my own assumption. I'm just inserting here and pushing it and forcing it to you. No, I, this is what I see from the text. And I hope you can see what I see here too. And I'm pretty confident that even though today's main topic is singleness, I think this will be truly beneficial and challenge to the married people too here. You will see why. Let me go with this one first. The benefit of singleness. The benefit of singleness. Verse 26. If you look at verse 26, Paul says, It is good, once again, for a person to remain as he is. Why is that? Are you single? Remain. Why? 
in the view of the present distress. So you don't have to be anxious about, I need to get married, I need to find someone, I need to get married. No, remain is okay, it's good. Why? If the view of the present distress. What does it mean? The present distress? Look at verse 28. Those who marry will have what? Worldly troubles. And I want to spare you from that. One good thing about being a single is that you'll be spared, you'll be relieved, you'll be free from the worldly troubles that married couples they have. Paul elaborates on that a little bit more from verse 32. So once again, look at 32. I'm pointing out from the text first before I explain. Verse 32. I want you to be free. I want to spare you. I want you to be free from anxiety. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about what? Worldly things. How to please his wife. And his interests are divided. His focus is divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about, once again, worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraints upon you. Benefit. This is good for you. The reason I'm teaching you and I'm giving you this advice, remaining as a single is good, is for your benefit, not to burden you, not to give any restraint upon you. No, I say this for your benefit because married people are anxious about Worldly things such as, for example, how to please their spouse. Singles, I want to spare you from that. Married people here, married brothers and sisters, you know, you better not forget the anniversary date, your spouse's birthday, especially husband, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Vice versa, Father's Day. What do I need to do for him, for her this year again? It comes, well, it comes every year. Multiple times I got to do something. But with a marriage, often it is not just one person you need to take care of on those special days. A lot of times marriage comes with a package. What do you mean? Now you're responsible and you need to care for your parents' in law siblings in law for Christmas, for New Year, for their birthdays, and on and on. You got to take care of them too. That's not all. If you're married and if you have children, more. Right? I just had my son's birthday this past week. So my wife and I, we had to think about what do we need to do? Do we need to do anything for him? Is after nine years now, I really wanted the minimum. <laughs> just, just keep it short, keep it simple. And relationship is not just about just those special occasions or days, but most importantly, it is about daily life. The financial responsibilities that you need to provide for your spouse, you need to take care of your children, provide for them. Children want to do this, they want to do that, they want to do this activity, that activity. They want to join this club and that club. You got to support. And the trendy shoes, clothes, a bag, or device, they want for somehow all of their friends have it. What a miracle. Only my child is the one who doesn't have it. So you got to get them something. And their schoolwork. How they are doing at school? Are they following school to study okay? Do I need to put them in the tutor? Do I need to send them some sort of after school program? You got to check. You got to support. On top of what you do, you got to take care of them. From the everyday of life of cleaning for them, laundry, cooking for them. And especially a lot of our church members, those of you who have little children, you need to shower them, putting them to bed. You need to prepare their what they're going to wear on the next day. Uh, sometimes you need to feed them every day. My wife, 
always tells me that how stressful it is even just to come up with a menu every single day. Like, if we was just her by herself, she was like, I would just eat anything, but because of me and the kids, I got to come up with something. Once you are married on top of your own work, you need to be sensitive about your spouse's work, your spouse's schedule, their stress, and their health. You got to take care of them. And one day, if you find your spouse looking somewhat upset or down, and you better be careful on that day how you behave, right? And husband, you need to know why. You better know the reason why she's not feeling well today. If your spouse wants to do some sort of venting out after a long day, what happened at the work, the conflict, or things like that with the coworker, I mean, you need to pay attention, or at least you need to pretend as if you are sincerely listening to it, right? That's all what Paul is talking about, pleasing your spouse. And you better not criticize your spouse. What happened? When she says something like, that was your fault. You did, you did it wrong. No, you better be on your spouse's side. Otherwise, the conflict at the work will happen in your home right there. It's all about how to please, how to take care of my family, my spouse, my children. I can't go on, things like this. I think the entire sermon time, what comes with a marriage? Paul says, singles, I want to spare you from that. I want to spare you from that. But do not misunderstand this. Singleness is not, not, not being encouraged by Paul just for the sake of a comfortable and easy lifestyle. We are living in the world where having comfortable and easy life is a purpose and goal of so many things. So many things are made, developed, purchased, promoted for a faster, easier, more relaxed, more comfortable life. And often that is the reason why we do many things, why we buy things, why we invest on things, why we work, so that we can have comfortable and easy life. If that's how we approach this, how sweet does this sound? It's just an easy, comfortable life. Once I get married, I'm bound to the spouse and in-laws and maybe even children. I need to take all the responsibilities. I need to take care of them. And I always need to make sacrifice after sacrifice. Not my own time. But right now, as a single, I can always have my own time focusing on my needs. What I want, I can just buy whatever I want. It's just me, 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 my own condition. That's all I need to care. I don't need to care about other people. Oh, then the singleness sounds surely attractive. And no wonder why so many people in our culture wants to get married at the later age as much as possible. I like this. Comfortable. Easy. But if you think that is how Paul was thinking too here, and that is the reason why Paul is promoting, I want to spare you that, so you know, be single. If that's how you understand Paul here, then you misunderstood Paul big time. There are two reasons why Paul is even considering this as a benefit of being a singleness, as something good. And it is not for selfish motivation or lazy reason. But one, it is for this reason. For the undivided devotion to the Lord. Why this is good? Why this is a benefit of single? Undivided devotion to the Lord. Look at verse 35 with me once again. It says, I say this for your own benefit. Not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. 
or some of us, maybe, like you too. I'm too young to get married. Or some singers, I just, I'm a singer because I cannot find anybody, anyone good right now. And so I'm just waiting until I find someone. Do not treat your singleness as a meaningless waiting period of life. I'm just too young. I'm a single, but because I'm too young, I'm just waiting to get old. So what's the point? Or, oh, I'm a single because I could not find anybody good yet. That's why I'm a single. As if you are just forced into a singleness and being a single right now as if there's no reason or purpose or meaning into it. Christians, your singleness has a purpose, no matter how young you are. And it is for your undivided devotion to the Lord. Think, those of you who are single, why the Lord has assigned that to you. And it is not because he could not find somebody for you. Let me say that again. A comfortable lifestyle or maximizing my personal fun, enjoyment, or comfort, it is not the goal of your singleness. Look again how Paul described the benefit of singleness here. Can you go back and look? What is the benefit of being a single? While the married people are so occupied with how to please my spouse, my children, my family, and so the singles will be occupied with what? According to that. How to please myself? How to have fun with my life? No. The singles will be occupied, Christian singles will be occupied with what? More, more, work, work, work. Oh, I'm a single, I can do more work. Or study school, 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 school. So I can do that more than married people so I can be more advanced in my career, in my school. Work, work, work. I'm a single, I have nothing else to do. Work, 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 work. Is that why? No. The unmarried, he says, is anxious about things of the Lord. That's their interest, their focus. How to please the Lord. How to be holy in body and spirit. That's the expectation on Christian singles. The major reason why Paul says singleness is good is that you don't have this additional burden of life and additional responsibilities. You don't have additional people in your life you need to follow after and take care of. So you have a greater opportunity, resources, to serve the Lord with greater devotion. My question is, are you? How are you managing your single life? What do you do besides your work? Where is your focus and interest while you are single? Are you making most out of your time of singleness? The reason why the singleness is good, Paul is even considering as something good, is for this purpose. Now, are you with me? The benefit of being single cannot be separated from this purpose. Without this purpose, you cannot say that that is a benefit. Number two, why remaining as a single is good? Because the appointed time is very near. Very near. Verse 29. Please go back to the text. I'll read the chunk from there with me. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who were rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the 
present form of this world is passing away. What is your point in time here? Yeah, you know. The end of the world. The return of Jesus. And Paul is reminding us we are in the last days. It's very near. And pay attention to what Paul says at the end of verse 31 once again. Paul did not say, this present world is passing away. He did not say that. Did you notice that? Oh, how th- this world is going to be all perish and pass away. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul, notice what he says there. The present form of this world. The present form of this world is passing away. You see that? The form of this world. How things are like in this world. How things are working in this world. The order of this world. The pattern. The system of this world will be gone soon. And it won't be there in the coming age anymore. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Why, Paul? You suddenly, why you say that? Sadducees. Those who believe, did not believe in the resurrection, like Pharisees, and there are another group of Sadducees. They did not believe in the resurrection. They came and asked a question to Jesus and challenged him by asking a question on a marriage. You say there's a resurrection, we come back to life. Okay, let's say there's a woman who got married with a man, but the man died, so she married to another man, and he died, so she married to another man, and he died. If there is a resurrection, we all come back to life, then whose wife is she going to be? Jesus, tell me. Whose wife? Now Jesus answered them. Matthew 20 to verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. In the coming kingdom, in the coming age, there is no such thing as a marriage. Marriage is a form, pattern, order of this age only. Marriage belongs only to this world. It is the form of this world. That is not an eternal thing. Marriage, I told you this, is not the ultimate reality. From the creation, yes, it was the will of God for mankind, for most of us. And God says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and he gave us this design of marriage, and it has been so from the creation order till now, till the end of the world. But Paul acknowledged that because of the such timing we are in, because the end is so close and the coming age is so near, Paul says, it is good to remain as a single so that you can live for and work for, serve for the coming kingdom and coming age that is right there. It's almost here with a greater devotion and service for that, aim for that age, work for that kingdom because it is very near. And remaining as a single is good because you have a greater advantage to work for that. Mary is not the central part of life that you've been prepared for that age that is very near is more important. That's why I say to you, being a single, remaining a single is a good thing too. Because you can work for that coming age. Anyways, marriage is not the eternal thing. Pastor Billy, if you say so, what if I remain as a single all my life and never get married? And even that, will you say that it is still good? Then I will never be able to experience or never ever once have this intimacy, love, and joy, the comfort that comes from the marriage relationship. I will never experience that, especially when you say there will be no marriage, then I will never have it. Forever! Never experienced what marriage is like at once. The sweetness of that. How can you say that it is good? One. 
do you think that heaven will give you lesser form of life than what we can have in this world? Two. If that's what you were thinking, here's one factor you forgot to count in. Sin. Even the most intimate relationship here on earth. Even the best loving couple that you can find in this world. Their relationship is stained by sin. That is why so many couples, though they love each other and they get married, they have conflicts, aches, sorrows, tears, hurts, misunderstanding in their marriage. That is why they feel, I don't think my spouse really understands me. I don't think my spouse really cares about me. I don't think he knows, she knows what I'm going through. They say that. But in heaven... What you will have, and you will have your fellow brothers and sisters, true family, eternal family of God, who are completely sanctified, in other words, completely free from sin, and who will share with you, the, in the deepest way, love for God and love for each other. Who you will have together the perfect joy, intimacy, and love. That's what you will experience. And that it will not in any degree stain by sin. The relationship that you don't have to be afraid at all. The relationship. It will never hurt you. But you will truly feel as understood and cared for. By the person. Even the best loving couple, married couple on earth, cannot beat that. Because this relationship is stained by sin. We don't even know what it is like to love someone and to really care for someone without any influence of sin. We never had that. We never experienced that. Even in our family, even in our marriage, even between parent and child. You say you care for your child, and I say this for your sake, but there's some sin, influence of sin. Think why there is no need of marriage in the coming kingdom. There's no reason for me to make... Okay, I'll be faithful to you. I will love you. I'll make a covenant with you. I promise you. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. Marriage doesn't need in the kingdom. What you will experience is far better than any relationship you can have here on earth. And what the Lord has promised to you there is far greater. You remaining as a single, God is not withholding something good from you. He has promised you something far better, and He's giving you opportunity, greater opportunity. I want to spare you from that, from these worldly things. But you be devoted to me more. I'm giving this great opportunity to you as a gift so that you will have a greater satisfaction and joy in the coming kingdom that is very near. A child comes to a mommy and say, Mommy, I'm hungry. I'm starving. I'm hungry. I want to eat something. And just try to open the candy cabinet. Mommy says, No, 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 no. Don't eat it right now. Don't eat anything right now. Just, honey, wait. But I'm hungry right now. I want it. I want it. And maybe the child is thinking, my mommy hates me. She doesn't like me. That's why she's withholding this something good. I say I'm hungry, but she's not giving me, letting me have it when I really want it. But she says this. I made all kinds of your favorite food. 
the best, good for you, healthy for you, dinner. I made a dinner for you. Something so good. This is good. I will, my child, I will let you eat if it's only 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. as we got to still wait for the dinner far long later. Then I will let you eat. But it will be done in 5, 10 minutes. It's so near. Almost ready. It's right there. I want you to have a greater experience. I want you to be satisfied by that. Enjoy that. Because it's so close. Can you just stay and wait? Live for that moment. Do you get it? Do you get what I'm trying to say? Singleness is not a punishment, leaving you to be lonely, and God does not care about my loneliness. Uh, it is Lord's gracious invitation for you to be devoted to Him more, to stay near by His side, and f- to, for you to store up more in the coming age, that I'm giving you opportunity to do so more than any other people. Come, my child, talk to me. I will spare you from the otherworldly things. Focus on me, devoted to me. Soon I will give you the greater satisfaction in me. Can you look at me and be on my side and work for that? It is not an unfulfilled life. Even if you live as a single and die as a single, it is not an unfulfilled life. It is not a second category life. As some people will say in this world, and maybe even your parents will say that if you're not married, something's wrong with you. You are not living an unfulfilled life. It is not. Do not forget that your Lord Jesus was a single person for all the days of his life. Your King, your Lord, came into this world and lived as a single all the days of his life and died on the cross as a single and he rose again and he ascended to heaven and he rose on high and he never got married. He never had a child. Which one of you will say to him, you don't know what it's like being married. You don't know what it's like being a parent. She just did not live the fulfilled life because he was all single. The Lord looked around the fellow believers and said, these are my brothers and sisters. These are genuinely, truly my family forever. Marriage will come to an end. Parent-child relationship will come to an end. The form of this world will pass away. But this, Jesus says, truly my family eternally. Singles, that's what you need to focus on. That's your family. Your fellow single brothers, sisters, that's what you need to minister and help and gather. That's your family where you, oh, I don't need to take care of anybody. No, that's where you need to be devoted to. Oh, it's all about my comfortable life, easy life. I don't need to take care of anybody. No, it is. They are whom you need to go after. The world may say there are all kinds of things about singleness, but you take every thought captive to Christ. You want to think, see yourself according to His truth. It is a gracious call, and it is a gracious gift for your devotion to Him. For singles, let me end with this for you. And I want to address the merit here. Most of you singles in this place, you will have a limited time of singleness. Limited season. One day, a lot of you will get married. You don't know how long your singleness is going to be. Do not waste it. 
those of us who are married, if you are listening to this message and if you were thinking, oh, yeah, it is good for you, singles. Good for you. Yes, you be devoted to the Lord, but I can't. I have so many things on my plate. Exactly what Pastor Billy said today. Family, spouse, in-law. Oh, so much responsibility. Busy with family. Is your marriage an excuse from your devotion to the Lord? Then go back. Would you, married, would you go back to read verse 29 with me again? Go back to read verse 29 again. And verse 29 all the way to 31. But let me just point out, what do you see there? Those who have wives, in other words, married, live as what? As if they have no wives. And verse 31, at the end, those who have worldly deals, live as if you don't have any worldly deals. Wait, what is Paul trying to say, married? Paul is not telling you to abandon your family, nor regret, neglect your family. No. But do not make as if all it matters is your marriage, your spouse, your family, your kids, as if that is the focus and the goal of your life. As if your life is all about this world, this life, this relationship. Because they are all fading away. It will all come to an end. So many Christians in this area, at least from what I can see in this Southern California here, are making their families as their idols. Yes, I said Christians, and I said idols. Marriage is good. Children and family are good and precious. But they are making, Christians are making something good, what God has given to them as good things, and turn them into one idols. So many Christians in this area Kicks activity, their experience, what they can have, their study, their vacation, pleasing my spouse and pleasing my children became the highest priority of life. To them, let these words of Paul ringing in their ears and their hearts. Your marriage relationship and parent-child relationship will too come to an end. That is not eternal, ultimate reality. Soon, this form of life will be over. And you will no longer regard each other on that day as my wife, as my husband, as my child, as my parents. No, that relationship will be gone. Do not make that as your altar where you bow down and try to make meaning of your life out of it. But use your marriage and your parenting as a place where you, your spouse, and your children be more devoted to the Lord. How can I use my marriage and my parenting that we together be more devoted to the Lord? Not just me and you always, you and me, what kind of things we can have known. Let's look into Christ together. Let's pray.